Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Welcome back to those of you joining us again. For the past two weeks, we have learned about load paths, limitations of the IRC, lateral loads, and the IRC wall provisions of Section 602.10. Our topic today is the third of our three-part webinar series on the 2018 IRC wall bracing provisions, where we will go through a complete example and learn about simplified wall bracing methods as well as APA's wall bracing calculator. My name is Mary Ewer. I'm a manager in APA, the Engineered Wood Association's Field Services Division, and I will serve as moderator for this session. APA is a nonprofit trade association representing manufacturers of a variety of common structural engineered wood products. In addition to quality verification and product testing, APA conducts research to improve engineered wood products and systems where they are used. We also educate users and specifiers on the product's intended use and potential applications. Before we start today's webinar, I need to cover some housekeeping details. Warren's presentation will last about 50 minutes. To ensure that everyone can hear it clearly, we have muted all participants. We encourage you to submit questions by typing them into the questions pane on the control panel on your screen. The panelists and I will be monitoring questions throughout the session, so please don't hold them until the end. And we will also answer some in the Q&A at the end of the session. We should get to most of your questions. A recording of today's program will be posted on our website, www.apawood.org, in about a week. I'd also like to note that today's webinar is approved for continuing education credits, including AIA and ICC. About an hour after the conclusion of the webinar, an email will be sent to each attendee. It will include a link where you can get customized certificates of completion. Today, like in the past two weeks, we have one speaker and two panelists. Our panelists, Matt Brown and Ron Nuttall, will be helping me answer questions and we're the presenters for the first two sessions in this series, which are available on our website, www.apawood.org. Our presenter today is Warren Hamrick. Warren is an engineered wood specialist for APA, the Engineered Wood Association, serving the southeastern United States. Warren consults with and conducts workshops for designers, code officials, and other building professionals on best practices for specification, selection, application, and installation of engineered wood products. Warren graduated from North Carolina State University with a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering. Prior to joining APA, Warren worked as a project manager for a structural engineering firm, which specialized in commercial construction. For those of you just joining us, welcome to the third and final part in APA's webinar series covering the 2018 IRC wall bracing provisions. I will now turn the microphone over to our speaker, Warren Hamrick. Okay, thank you, Mary, and uh, welcome everyone. Let's jump right into our learning objectives. Uh, what we're going to do today is apply what you have learned in our previous two webinars uh, with the IRC wall bracing provisions. We're going to apply that to a couple of example plans. After working through those, we're then going to look at some alternatives. We're going to look at the IRC simplified and the APA simplified method. And then we are going to introduce the APA online wall bracing calculator. A couple of resources that are really helpful when uh, looking at wall bracing are a book titled A Guide to the 2018 IRC Wood Wall Bracing Provisions. This was co-authored by APA and ICC, and it is available on the iccsafe.org website. Another good resource is our introduction to wall bracing document, which is uh, F, form F430, and that's available at apawood.org. So during this series, uh, we basically work from left to right through the topics shown on these tabs. 
So we covered IRC prescriptive wall bracing, and, and that included, um, we had discussions on lateral forces that houses should resist. We talked about the limits to the IRC wall bracing. We then moved on to braced wall lines and braced wall panels. Using that, we determined the required length of bracing, and then talked about uh, the panel placement requirements. And you know this process is is a lot of steps and it's fairly lengthy. So what we wanted to do today was start by walking through a couple of examples, and then after doing those examples, uh, introduce those alternatives. So jumping right in to our first example, and what we're going to do is uh, this is the second story of a home. Uh, example two is going to be the first story of the same house. So you're going to get to see kind of how you can work through a, a whole house. So we're seismic design category C. This is a single family dwelling. Uh, ultimate wind speed of 115 miles per hour, wind exposure C. We're going to choose method wood structural panel. And uh, just for review, wood structural panel can be plywood or OSB. Again, this is the upper of a two story. Our story height is nine feet and our roof eave to ridge height is 16. So let's take a look at our plan. We are planning to just have brace wall lines on the exterior walls. We have a brace wall line spacing of about 37 feet between uh, brace wall lines A and B, about 25 feet between one and two. And if you'll remember, those are the dimensions we're gonna go into our table with. This decision tree uh, was introduced in a previous webinar. This is really a helpful first step when you're looking at a plan. So you're gonna take your criteria and the first question that you have to ask is, are we going to, we know we need to look at the wind requirements. Are we gonna to need to look at the seismic table? So in, in our case, we're seismic design category C, which is kind of the, uh, that's the area where you really have to start paying attention to seismic because if you're single family, one and two family detached dwelling, I should say, you can ignore seismic in seismic design, in seismic design category C. If this happened to be a townhome, we would have to look at the seismic requirements as well as the wind. Uh, and as covered in part two of our webinar series, if you do have to look at the seismic requirements, you do both wind and seismic, and then the uh, larger amount of bracing is going to control. But in our case, we're C, uh, single family, so we can ignore seismic. So our, our uh, first step after going through our criteria is to determine the required length of bracing. Um, the left-hand column shows our ultimate wind speed, which were 115. Uh, the next column is your story location. So we are the upper floor of a two story. So we're in the first row. Uh, we're using method wood structural panel. We have approximately 25 foot spacing between brace wall lines one and two. And we are gonna interpolate uh, the numbers that we're pulling out of the table. And we're about 37 feet between brace wall lines A and B. So let's pull out that data and we're, we've already uh, will have interpolated uh, those numbers. So after we do that, we can see for brace wall lines one and two, we need 4.5 feet of bracing. For brace wall lines A and B, we need 6.6 .6 feet of bracing. Now, one thing that is pretty interesting here is you'll notice that the shorter walls actually require more bracing. And this applies to wind, uh, to the wind controlled houses. So we're, we're looking at wind here. The reason that is, is if you think about wind acting on the south wall, that's a longer wall, which is gonna have more area and it's gonna, gonna have a greater wind load. But that wind load is actually gonna be resisted by the perpendicular walls. So the wind load acting on the longer walls is resisted by the, in this case, the shorter uh, perpendicular walls. So that's why your shorter walls actually require more bracing when you're looking at wind. So we come out with the required length of bracing. We then need to adjust that amount depending on the characteristics of the house. 
So in our case, uh, for the exposure category, we are two stories and we're exposure C. So we're going to need to multiply our number by 1.3. We have a uh, roof eave to ridge height of 16 feet and we are the upper floor of a two story. Uh, so we're going to interpolate again between 1.3 and 1.6, and we're going to get 1.36. Our next adjustment is our nine-foot story height. So we get to take a, a slight reduction in our amount of bracing because of that. So we're going to multiply by 0.95. Next is the adjustment factor for number of brace wall lines. And in our case, we have two, so we don't need to adjust our number. So to summarize, uh, we're going to need to multiply by 1.3 for the exposure category, 1.36 for roof eave to ridge height, and 0 0.95 for our story height. So the next step is to determine the minimum length of brace wall panels. And that's going to depend on your method and the wall height. So in our case, we are a method with structural panel. So our minimum uh length of uh of bracing for wood structural panel for a qualified brace wall panel uh our baseline is going to be 48 inches so let's go back to our plan and do the math so for brace wall lines one and two we started with the 4.5 feet out of the table we then multiply by our adjustment factors and we come up with 7.6 feet of bracing required Starting at the north wall, we're able to find two four-foot sections, which add up to eight feet, so that meets our uh, amount of qualified bracing. Now, if you think back to our previous uh, webinars, that's not the only thing that we have to meet. You also have to meet placement requirements. So that means you have to have a qualified brace wall panel within 10 feet of the end of the brace wall line and then the panels cannot be more than 20 feet apart, edge to edge. So in our case, uh, we meet placement and length requirements. So brace wall line one is in compliance. So let's move down to two. Pretty similar. We have two four foot sections. So we meet the length and the placement requirements. Now let's look at the shorter walls. And again, these are going to require more bracing. So we started with a base of 6.6 .6 feet out of our table. We then multiply by our adjustment factors, and we see we need 11.1 .1 feet of qualified bracing along brace wall lines A and B. So along A, we have three four-foot sections, uh, which add up to 12 feet. We also meet our placement requirements. So brace wall line A works. Let's take a look at B. So we had 12 feet at the upper right portion of the wall. So we have 12 feet of qualified bracing, which is greater than 11.1. .1. Now, that's not the last check. Again, we have to meet the placement requirements. Unfortunately, the section on the bottom right is less than four feet. It's actually 42 inches. Now, the good thing, and this was covered in the previous webinar as well, you are allowed to take partial credit if you have a, a certain width. And in our case, for method wood structural panel, if you have 42 inches, you get to count that, but you don't get to count the full 42. You actually get to count 36. So with that, we add that three feet in. So that gives us 15 feet of bracing. But what was important there is this allows us to meet our placement requirements. So a final plan just showing where we have the bracing. Um, you know, this is really helpful uh, when you're talking about what you submit to a building official. You know, this lets them see what methods you're using, where you're locating the panels, and it helps to think through all of it to make sure you have the lengths required as well as the placement. So our example two, again, is gonna be the first level of this same house. So our Characteristics are the same as far as wind, we're 115, exposure C, we're single, we're seismic design category C. This is a single family. What we're going to change is our method. 
So on the first floor, we're going to go to method continuously sheathed wood structural panel. And we do have a taller story height. Our story height is 10 feet, uh, obviously the same roof eave to ridge height. So this is our first floor plan. Uh, you may notice the columns outside of the body of the house. That's just for a porch. Uh, so those can be ignored for our case today. So let's go back to our decision tree. This is a little bit repetitive just because it's the same house. We already know we only need to look at wind, but you know, this is always a good first step. So we're in seismic design category C and we're single family. So you can ignore the seismic and focus on the wind. So let's go back to our minimum length table. Now we're gonna go into this table at a different location. Uh, we, we're still 115 miles per hour ultimate wind speed, but now we're looking at the first of a two story. <clears throat> so in the story location, we're gonna be in the middle row. Our brace wall line spacing is about 25 feet for uh, the first two brace wall lines. <clears throat> we're looking at 37 for the other two, and we are going to interpolate this data. So going back to our plans, uh, after we do the interpolation, the amount of bracing between brace wall lines one and two that's required for brace wall lines one and two is 7.75 feet. For A and B, it's 10.75 feet. So again, you're seeing we need more bracing for the shorter walls when we're looking at wind. So let's take these numbers and our next step, we're going to need to adjust them. So now we are at, we are a two story, we're exposure C, so we need to adjust that number by 1.3. We're at a different spot on our roof eave to ridge height, uh, even though the uh, eave to ridge height of 16 feet is the same when we were looking, as when we were looking at the second level, but now we're looking at a roof plus a floor, so we're going to interpolate between 1.15 and 1.3, and we come up with 1.18. Our story height, we're 10 feet, so there's no adjustment needed there. Our number of brace wall lines is two, so no adjustment there. So in this case, on the first level, we just have uh, two adjustments that we need to make. Our exposure C is 1.3. Our roof eave to ridge is 1.18. So with the continuously sheathed wood structural panel method, the minimum lengths are going to be determined by the adjacent openings. So in our case, we have a door opening of 96 inches. So we need a minimum of 38 inches to count as qualified bracing. Our windows are less than uh, 64 inches. So we need 30 inches next to the windows to count as qualified bracing. So again, just a summary of what we just pulled out of our table. We need 38 inches next to the door. We need 30 inches next to uh, the windows. So let's go back to our plan and think about where we can pick up this bracing. We start with our required length that we pulled out of the table. So we are 7.75 feet and we multiply by our adjustment factors. So we're multiplying by 1.3 and 1.18. We come up with a length of bracing needed as 11.9 feet for brace wall lines one and two. Starting on the north wall, we're able to pick up a three foot section next to the window. Uh, we have an eight foot section and then a four foot section, and that adds up to 15 feet of qualified bracing, which is greater than our 11.9. Uh, it also meets our placement requirements. At the south wall of the house, there we also are able to pick up 15 feet. So we can meet our length requirements and we also meet our placement requirements. So these two walls are in compliance. So now let's take a look at uh, brace wall lines A and B. Again, these are gonna need more bracing. So after we start with our 10.75 feet, 
uh, we adjust that. We come up with needing 16.4 feet of bracing on brace wall lines A and B. So in the continuously sheathed method, as we reviewed in our previous webinars, all sheathable surfaces must have wood structural panels. And what we're counting is the full height sections. So along brace wall line A, we are counting all of these full height sections. They all meet the minimum length requirements. So they're all qualified and they add up to 15.5 feet. Along brace wall line B, we end up with the same scenario. We have all of the, all of the full height sections count and they still only add up to 15.5 feet, which is less than our 16.4. So, you know, this is fairly close, but it's, it doesn't work. So what do you do in this case? Well, you know, if you have some flexibility with your window sizes, that would be great. You know, you, you only need about a foot, but you know, we, we usually want more windows, not less. So that may not be an option. You know, one thing you could look at is uh, one of the narrow bracing methods. Those do require an extra level of detailing and some hardware in most cases. What may be the easiest thing to do in this case is to look at adding an interior brace wall line and catch some of the interior walls. They likely already have gypsum on those walls. And as long as you meet the method gypsum board requirements, you can count that as a brace wall line. Now, that probably is the easiest thing to do, but it will mean going back to your calculations because a couple of things would change. Due to time, we're not going to go backwards and do this, but I just wanted to point out a couple of things that we would need to, to think about. So if you picked up the interior wall, the first thing is it's going to lessen your brace wall line spacing. And when you go into your brace wall line qualified or the required length table, you're going to get a smaller number there, which is good. That's what we want. But the adjustment factor will also change because we will have multiple brace wall lines. So there would be an adjustment factor. You're still going to end up with less bracing along each brace wall line, but you will need to add in that other adjustment factor. So just going back and again, brace wall lines A and B need a little more work on this example, but this is the kind of a, a key plan that is really helpful for the building officials. And it seems to make everybody's life a lot easier when you have something like this. Now, you know, those were, uh, in fairness, those were fairly simple plans, but it still was quite a bit of work to go through all of the steps, all of the adjustment factors. And, you know, there are some alternatives that may be able to, it'll be able to save you some time and still have a code compliant, structurally sound house. So we're gonna begin with the IRC simplified method. So this is covered in the IRC in section 602.12. It does have fewer steps, but there are some limitations. The house must be in seismic design category A, B, or C if it's a detached one or two family, A or B if it's a townhouse. Your ultimate wind speed must be 130 miles per hour or less, and you can't have exposure D. It's limited to exposure B or C. It's a one, two, or three story structure, and the materials for your brace wall panels are limited. You're limited to wood structural panels, so that's either OSB or plywood, or structural fiberboard uh, sheathing. You do have to have gypsum board on the interior side of the walls. You also have some dimensional requirements. You have a 60 foot maximum length and or width of the building, maximum eave to ridge height of 15 feet, maximum story height of 10 feet, and there is a ratio requirement. So the maximum ratio between the long and the short side of the building is three to one. You can cantilever 24 inches beyond the foundation max. So this could be something like a bay window. And then we have a limitation of no cripple walls on a three-story building. 
So some of the advantages, you know, if you meet the criteria, you can completely ignore seismic. Your bracing is only going to be on the exterior walls, so you don't have to worry about the line length or spacing. There are no additional adjustment factors to check, and there is no interpolation. You round everything up. So the procedure for the IRC simplified. Step one, we're going to draw a rectangle around the perimeter of the building. So this is the first and second floor of a plan. And one of the first things you might notice is the rectangle is different size is a different size on the first floor as the second floor. So the rectangle has to include all offsets or projections. So if you have like a, uh, a sunroom or a garage at the first level, the rectangle has to include all of that. If you have an open structure like a carport or a deck, you don't have to include that. Once you have your rectangles drawn, you then need to note the dimensions of the long side and the short side. That's what you're going to go into your tables with. When you go into the table, you're going to determine the amount of bracing units required. So this is completely different than the IRC prescriptive. You know, we, we had been working with going into the table, pulling out a required bracing length, and then adjusting. So with the IRC simplified, you're going to go into the table and you're going to come out with a number of bracing units. And this is what the table looks like. So you're going to use your dimensions from your long and your short side, and this is going to determine the number of bracing units. So you can see this table looks quite a bit different. You know, instead of our, our lengths, it's just number of units. And if you notice, you're going to use the length of the short side to determine the bracing units on the long side and the length of the long side to determine the bracing units on the short side. And since this is a wind only method, this is that same concept of the perpendicular walls uh, providing the support. So you may be asking, what exactly is a bracing unit? This is a, a new concept for us. You're limited to wood structural panel or structural fiberboard, as we covered earlier. You do have a choice, though. You can either be continuous. So in that case, you would sheathe all sheathable surfaces. So above and below openings, gable ends, uh, even if it's too narrow to count as, as a bracing unit, you have to sheathe it. Or you can be intermittent. The minimum length to count as a bracing unit is three feet. If you're doing continuous, you're getting credit for that strong, stiff box when you're sheathing everything. So you can go a little narrower, you're three feet. If you're going to do intermittent, you have to have four feet minimum to count as a bracing unit. Now, there are some narrow methods, and we covered all of these in our previous webinars in more detail. But for today, the first two, these are continuous methods. So these are only going to apply if you choose to use continuous uh, sheathing. First is continuously sheathed garage. And what you may notice is these narrow methods don't necessarily count as a full bracing unit. So our continuously sheathed garage is going to count as 0.5 units. Continuously sheathed portal frame, 0.75. If you use portal frame hold downs or alternate brace wall, that does count as a full unit. Uh, portal frame garage is 0.75 units. And these, you know, we covered these in part two of our webinar series. They do obviously have to be constructed based on the code requirements that we covered. Our next uh, rule is you have to stagger the number of bracing units. So pretty similar to the IRC prescriptive, you have your units and you have to locate them in a logical way. So you'll see these are somewhat similar to the IRC uh, prescriptive, no more than 20 feet edge to edge for your bracing units. This is a little bit different. You have to have a bracing unit within 12 feet of the end of the wall line. You know, for the IRC prescriptive, that was 10 feet. So that's a little bit different. 
And you can see in this elevation where we show open studs where we're not having a bracing unit as well as below these openings. So we're obviously, in this example, this is an intermittent method. So we need 48 inch minimum to count as a bracing unit when intermittent. If this was fully sheathed, we could go down to three feet. So I think the, the best way to, to go through these steps is to look at an example. So our example today is seismic design category B. We're ultimate wind speed of 115 exposure B. We're going to choose to use method continuously sheathed wood structural panel. So that means we can go down to as narrow as three feet. This is a one story home with nine foot wall height, 15 foot eave to ridge. So the first thing you have to look at is does this house fit in the simplified or the IRC simplified wall bracing world? And it does. So let's take a look at our plan. Now, when I first look at this plan, you know, this looks a little more complicated than the, the previous examples, but stick with us and we're, we'll, we'll work step by step through this method and show how it, it can make things uh, quite a bit easier if your house fits in the requirements. So our first step, we need to draw a rectangle around the perimeter. And in our case, we do meet the less than 60 feet. It's close, but we do meet that. Our next step is we're going to take the dimensions of the long side and the short side and go into the tables to pull out the number of bracing units. Now, again, interpolation is not allowed, so we're going to round those up. So our dimension of our long side is going to be 60 feet. The table goes in 10 foot increments the dimension of our short side is going to be 50 feet. So let's take a look at the table. So the first couple of uh, columns look pretty similar. Uh, we have our ultimate wind speed, and then we need to locate our uh, story level. We are going to be in the 15 foot eave to ridge height. And again, we have a 50 foot short side, a 60 foot long side. When we go through that, you can see with the arrows or with the circles, it turns out in this case, we're gonna need four bracing units on each side of our plan. So let's jump back to our plan. And this time we'll start on the south wall. So we have garage openings on the south wall. We, want, we need narrow bracing units on the on the short walls uh, at the garage opening. So in this case, we're going to use the continuously sheathed portal frame method. And remember, those only count as 0.75 units. As we move to the right on the south wall, we've located three more bracing units. And when we add all those up, we end up with 5.25 bracing units, which is greater than four. So that meets the number of unit requirement. We also have to meet our placement requirements. And you can see we do. Uh, we're within 12 feet of the ends and no more than 20 feet edge to edge. So our south wall is good. Let's go to our north wall. In our case, we ended up with five bracing units, which is greater than four. So we're good. All of those units are three feet or greater. We also meet our placement requirements. We're within 12 feet of the ends and no more than 20 feet edge to edge. So now let's look at our east and west walls. Starting with the west wall, uh, we have four qualified bracing units. So that meets our bracing unit requirement. Uh, we, also are, we also meet our placement requirements. And the east wall is the same. Uh, we have four bracing units. We meet placement. And this house is now completely compliant. So you can see we were able to take a, a fairly complex looking plan. And because it fell into the requirements of the IRC simplified method, you know, we were able to get this house compliant in a fairly short period of time. Our next topic is going to be the APA simplified method. So a way that we can look at this is this method is kind of an enhanced variation of the IRC simplified 
This also is going to give you a you know, streamlined approach to meeting the bracing requirements. This is based on our system report, which is SR102. We updated this back in April of this year. So you're only going to consider, you know, your exterior walls. There are a few simple calculations and only one bracing method that you need to worry about. So let's jump into the APA Simplified. So this method, like uh, others that we've gone over in this webinar series, is a prescriptive method. So this is not engineered. And this is going to take advantage of the full strength of fully sheathed OSB and plywood. So you're going to take advantage of that strong, stiff box. Because of that, it's going to recognize strength found in shorter panels, which we'll expand upon that. And this is it, it's much simpler and, and really reduces the complexity compared to the IRC prescriptive. And it's based on years of testing and experience from APA. And we'll talk about one of those tests in just a second. So the basis of it for IRC prescriptive wood structural panels can be a code minimum of three eighths of an inch. With APA simplified, that minimum is seven sixteenths. Now, for much of the country, that's not really a change. Uh, seven sixteenths is a common wall sheathing thickness in much of the country. So there's no real adjustment there for, for many people. One thing we do in certain situations with APA simplified is increase the frequency of fasteners. This will not apply to a single story or the top of a multi-story. And we'll talk about that, the increase in just a second. This is a continuously sheathed method. So all exterior wall panels are to be sheathed. So a quick comparison. You know, the first, the first change from the minimum is the 7 16 thickness wood structural panel. Not really a change for a lot of the country, but it is a change from the minimums. Nailing at the panel edges can go down to four inches on center, but that will not apply to a single story or the top of a multi-story. That will stay at six inches on center in those cases. When we look at the amount of required bracing, we are going to be looking at total length of bracing. So we won't be looking at bracing units. We can, taking advantage of the continuously sheath method, you know, we can go down to as narrow as 20 inches without a portal frame um, in some cases. And commonly used methods like continuously sheathed portal frame, we get to count 1.5 times the actual length. And partial length bracing is allowed in eight and nine foot walls. So you'll get to take partial credit for uh, brace wall panels that are actually less than the minimum. And, and we'll work through an example that uh, we'll have some of these. So I mentioned this was based on testing. So this is a, a pretty powerful slide. This is the results of full house testing that was performed at our uh, testing facility in Tacoma, Washington. We built a house and braced it with various code approved bracing methods. So all of these methods met the prescriptive wall bracing code. The big takeaway here is if you compare wood structural panel intermittent bracing to continuously sheathed wood structural panel, and again, both of these met prescriptive code requirements, the continuously sheathed wood structural panel resisted 88% more load than the intermittent wood structural panel. So that's why you're able to take advantage of that strong, stiff box. So there are four steps in the APA simplified method. We need to check the system criteria. We're going to determine the required bracing length. And then we do have a wall height multiplier, so an adjustment factor similar to the IRC prescriptive. We then need to identify the full height sections and see if they meet the minimum lengths and the distribution requirements. And then we go back and we add all qualified bracing to make sure it's greater than our uh, amount needed. So there are also some dimensional criteria and, uh, and location criteria. 
No side can be longer than 60 feet. However, if you're wondering, if you're thinking about a house greater than 60 feet, we'll briefly go over what you can do with the APA simplified method to be able to apply it to houses greater than 60 feet after our example. Three stories or less, wall heights less than or equal to 12 feet, uh, roof eave to ridge height is limited to 15 feet, your ultimate wind speeds 130 miles per hour or less, and if you're single family, you must be in seismic design category A, B, or C. Townhomes are limited to seismic design categories A or B. So what we're going to do for our example is we're going to we're going to look at the front wall of this house. So the depth is 40 feet. So that's what we need to go into the tables. The roof eave to ridge height is less than or equal to 15. So we we're good there. We have a nine foot first floor height and that's the floor we're going to be looking at we're exposure b 115 mile per hour ultimate wind zone and we do have drywall on the inside of the exterior walls so this step is exactly like our c simplified we draw a rectangle around the house we have to include all bump outs we then go into the table with the long and short side now, when we go into the table for our particular example, we're going to come out with a required length of bracing. And in our case, that's 11.4 feet. We then have a wall height adjustment factor. Uh, so in our case, we get to take a slight reduction. So we multiply that by 0.95. Our next step is going to be identifying the full height sections. Uh, so you can see these are denoted in red and the plan is is underneath so it's a good good practice to identify these and and note each of their uh, widths because that's what we're going to need to know to determine if this can be uh, qualified bracing so this table uh it's table one in the apa system report but it's excerpted from the irc continuous wall bracing section this is where we're going to determine our minimum lengths. So we're going to start with the garage with the door openings. Our garage has a eight foot header height. So the uh, top circle shows that we need a minimum of 16 inches next to the garage openings. Our door is 80 inches. So the bottom shirt circle showing we need 30 inch minimum next to the doors. So Applying that to our plan, uh, we're only using the outermost walls at the garage at this point. You know, if we needed more bracing, we could look at the dividing wall between the garage door openings. But for right now, we're just going to use the outermost walls. Those are each 16 inches, so they count and they can be multiplied by 1.5. So they can each count as 24. Moving over to the uh, front door of the house. We have 32 inches, uh, that meets our minimum, so we can count 32 inches there. So now let's look at the panels next to the windows. Those panels don't meet the minimums, but we may be able to take partial credit. So this is where we wanted to highlight the partial credit section. Uh, so if our full height sections are 24 inches, next to the windows we can count 22 inches towards the requirements if the full height sections are 20 inches we can count 18. so we do have two uh, sections that are 24 so they'll count as 22 and then two 22 inch sections will count as 18. the sections less than 20 inches which are shown in red obviously they still have to be sheathed but they don't count towards our bracing requirements so now let's sum up our, uh, our amount of qualified bracing. This can be a little confusing because what we're summing up doesn't match the plan dimensions necessarily. Uh, so we start on the left side, we have a 16 inch full height section that counts as 24. That's because we multiply that by 1.5 because it is continuously sheathed portal frame. As we move along the wall, you'll also see some sections. Um, for instance, the green section next to the first window 
is 24 and it counts as 22. That's that partial credit uh, concept. So as we go through, we add all of our qualified bracing up. We get 16 feet eligible for bracing. We also need to make sure we meet the placement requirements. And these are the same as the IRC simplified. Uh, we, need, we need a panel within 12 feet of either end or both ends, and we need no more than 20 feet edge to edge. So you can see we meet those requirements. And with that, uh, that front wall is checked and in compliance. So I mentioned earlier, you're limited to 60 feet, uh, but there is an option if you have a house that's longer than, uh, with a dimension longer than 60 feet. So in this case, we have a, a house with uh, one wall that's 70 feet in length. So how can you apply the IRC or the APA simplified to this plan? Well, the first thing you do is to break it up into multiple rectangles. Uh, it's best to choose a common wall line. And in this case, we divided the house into a 50 by 40 foot rectangle and a 20 by 20 foot. It's a square in this case. <clears throat> we then determine the bracing units for each rectangle independently using the steps we just went over. So that's pretty straightforward. You do have to meet the placement requirements as well. Then we rejoin the rectangles. So for most of the structure, this is pretty easy, but the common wall requires a little more thought. So at the common wall, uh, there are rules that apply that are in our system report. And the big question we get is often this common wall will have part of the wall interior, part exterior. And the APA uh, simplified method is a continuously sheathed method. So the question we get is do you have to sheath the interior with wood structural panels? Well, the short answer to that is no. Uh, you are allowed to use method gypsum board. Uh, for that interior wall, providing you meet a, a set of rules. That's a little bit outside of what we're going to cover today, but I did want to introduce that, first of all, you can have a house with a, with a side longer than 60 feet and still use APA Simplified, uh, and that you don't necessarily have to sheathe an interior wall with wood structural panels. So that's covered in detail in our system report. Another question that we get is uh, the acceptability with code officials. So there are actually five states that have the APA simplified method uh, actually accepted and written into their code. And this is an excerpt from Georgia. Um, the other states are North Carolina, Indiana, Montana, and Idaho. And I did kind of a, a informal survey with our other field services representatives. And we have at least 10 other states which have allowed the APA simplified. And I, you know, I cover North and South Carolina and, and in talking with code officials in South Carolina where it's not written into the state code, uh, I, I found them very receptive to this method. The last item we wanted to cover today is the APA online wall bracing calculator. So this calculator is updated for every code cycle, starting with the 2009 IRC, and it's going to be based off of the IRC wall bracing provisions. You, ac you access this calculator through apawood.org. Uh, there's a quick start guide that's available to download. There's also a short step-by-step uh, -step video. So what you do with the calculator, you're gonna you're gonna build out your plan, basically. You're gonna locate your brace wall lines, just like you do when you're physically uh, looking at a plan. After you locate those brace wall lines, then you're gonna build out the wall with your brace wall panels uh, and your openings. One thing that's pretty useful when you first look at the calculator, you see there's, there's quite a, a lot of inputs uh, to put in. You'll notice there's a gray question mark beside, uh, beside most of them. If you hover over that question mark, you're gonna get a pop-up window that's gonna get you a detailed definition of, in this case, this is the mean roof height less than 30 feet. So what does that mean? 
Well, this pop-up's going to give you a definition of exactly what that means, and often there'll be a diagram as well. So it's that's a good way to work through the calculator. You can hover over the question marks, and it'll be really clear what we're asking you to input. So let's walk through the steps. Um, step one is putting in your design criteria. Um, you also input your project information, and that's really helpful because at the end of this, you're going to get a printout, and you can submit that printout to a building official, and your project information is going to have you know, the address, uh, the builder, the plan name, things that will be helpful to have on that printout. This is the step where you enter your code version, you know, your seismic design category, wind speed, uh, and things like number of stories. You then input your wall line details. So this is when where you input your braced wall lines. Uh, this is where you put in the lengths of the lines and the dimensions between the lines. And this is where you put in things like your uh, blocking, if gypsum's installed, wall heights. The requirements for all this is completely based on the IRC prescriptive that we've gone over in our previous webinars. But this is where you input that information. And as you know, the brace wall lines are made up of brace wall panels. So in step three, you're going to put in the details of these panels. Uh, this is where you're going to put in your panel methods and the placements. And you're also going to put in your openings. So you can put in door, window, garage openings. Uh, you put in each segment separately and build the elevation of your wall. And lastly, you're going to get a project report. Uh, and this can be printed or you can save it as a PDF. So each wall line is going to show an elevation view and a summary. It's going to it's going to cover the amount of bracing required versus the amount of qualified bracing. It'll note the wind factors. And if seismic is required, it's also going to note the seismic factors. So let's run through an example. We're in seismic design category A single family, 115 mile per hour, ultimate wind speed, and we're wind exposure C. We're going to use method continuously sheathed wood structural panel on our one-story home. Uh, we have a wall height of nine feet, roof eave to ridge 16 feet. So as you can see, this plan is it's fairly similar to some of the others that we've done. Uh, one concept that we're doing here is if you notice the south wall of the plan has a bump out, and we don't have a brace wall line running through that wall. This was covered in a previous webinar, but you can do this based on the offset provisions in the IRC. So that wall is within four feet of a brace wall line, so you're able to pick it up. Moving on to entering the information into our calculator. So in this case, we're going to start a new project as denoted by the red arrow at the bottom of your screen. When you're using our calculator, if you are working on a plan and you need to stop, you can save it to your computer. And then when you go back in, you would be able to go to the import existing project next to the button that we're going to use. But for us, we're starting a new project. We first enter the project information and the design criteria. Again, this is things like the address of the house. The You can put the designer there. You're also going to put which code you're using. In our case, uh, you can see we highlighted the 2018 IRC. We are a one to two family in seismic design category A through C. 115 mile per hour, exposure C, one story. We do not have a cripple wall, and we have a mean roof height less than 30 feet. We next go to our wall line details. So we have two brace wall lines, and this is where you enter that information. So we're going to input the dimension between the brace wall lines and the length of those lines. And this is where uh, we also put things like roof eave to ridge and information about gypsum and blocking. Once we have our brace wall lines, now we're going to build the elevation of, of our wall. Uh, we're using continuously sheathed wood structural panel in this example, and we're looking at brace wall line one, and that's noted in the upper right portion of the page, 
And it also is highlighted on the plan on the lower left portion. So this helps you keep up with which wall you're looking at. You input details about each bracing segment as well as the dimension and placement of openings. And on the right side, we're getting a real time output of the compliance of that particular brace wall line. As you can see, segment B1 in this case is highlighted and uh, it's a bracing segment which is continuously sheathed wood structural panel and the length is three feet. Now we're looking at brace wall line two and this included a garage opening. Segment B2 is highlighted in the elevation and you can see that this is a continuously sheathed garage method and this segment is two foot three inches. Our last step after you build all of your walls is producing a project report. And this report, again, it can be printed or you can save it as a PDF. Your project information is going to be at the top. And below that, uh, in our case, we're seeing a detail for brace wall line one. And this wall line required 12.37 feet of bracing and we provided 21.83 feet. So we had enough qualified bracing and met the placement requirements. So this wall line is compliant, as you can see in the uh, bracing status column. One good thing with, the, with this printout is you can easily compare it to the plan. And we're using a key plan like we introduced in our earlier examples. Uh, this can make it you know, very easy for a building official to double check. One thing you'll notice here, uh, segment B1 is a uh, bracing, it was put in as a bracing segment, but it did not meet the minimum bracing requirements. So it's counting as zero as a qualified segment. So that length of B1 is not actually counting towards our qualified bracing. Now, fortunately, we still had enough qualified bracing uh, to meet requirements plus we met our, our placement requirements. So this wall line is compliant. Moving to the south wall for wall line two, you know, the left side is our continuously sheathed garage that we've inputted. And the output will denote that. And it also gives the required nailing pattern, which is required by the IRC and we covered in our previous webinars. This wall line required 12.37 feet of bracing and we have 15.33 feet. So this wall line is also compliant. So at this time, I'm gonna turn it back to Mary. I think she has been monitoring questions. Yes, thank you, Warren. Um, I appreciate all of that information. I have been monitoring questions. We have had quite a few come in during this session. so. Thank you to our audience for sending us questions and to Matt and Ron for helping me answer those. Before we jump to, to a Q&A session, I wanna point out that you can see a QR code on your screen. If you open your camera on your smartphone, a link will pop up to take you to the survey on this session. A link will also be emailed to you in about an hour. So Warren, like I said, we've had quite a few questions come in. One of them relates to the APA simplified method. And on that example, the links that you were summing on that last slide didn't match the peer width. Some were bigger and some were smaller. Can you explain that a little bit more? Yeah, that's an area that it can be really confusing. So you are able to take, uh, you mentioned some are larger than the actual plan dimensions. Well, in our example, those areas we were using continuously sheet portal frame and we were able to take 1.5 times the actual length i believe we had 16 inches and we were able to count 24 in our case so there are some of the narrow methods where you get to count more than what's shown on the plan on the other hand the there were some locations where it was less so at certain wall heights you can take partial credit even if you don't have the code required minimums. And it varies based on opening sizes, but there is a partial length table that we went over where you were able to, you couldn't count the full width, but you could take partial credit. So that's why that can be a little confusing, but if you work through it carefully, uh, the more you do it, the easier it becomes. 
Wonderful, thank you. For the APA wall bracing calculator, what's the maximum wind speed that that accounts for and does it address hold down needs? Yes, so the, the APA wall bracing calculator is based on the IRC provisions that we covered uh, in, in great detail in webinars one and two of this series. So that's gonna be limited to less than 140 miles per hour ultimate wind speed. And it will cover uh, things like hold down. So just for an instance, you know, if, if you needed a hold down to meet the return requirements or uh, various other IRC uh, provisions, the bracing calculator will pick that up and will include the hold down information. Great, thank you. And so that is, it's in line with the IRC and it has to be 140 miles an hour or less. So if you're over that, you have to go to an alternate design method like an engineer or the wood frame construction manual or a different approved option, correct? That's correct, yes. Great, and we have time for one more question. Like I said, we had a ton come in. We have been answering like crazy during the session. Um, we will do our best to, if we didn't get to you, we will get back to you. So our last question is, the IRC simplified and APA simplified seemed pretty similar. Is there really a difference there? They are similar. Um, uh, you know, I think I said that, that the APA is kind of an enhanced version of the IRC. Um, you know, the, the IRC works really well but it's usually for I'll call it simpler designs. You know, if you if you took a look at a lot of the commonly used plans, let's say for uh, production builders, you know, that those would have a pretty hard time meeting the IRC requirements. APA gets you a little more. The APA simplified gets you a little more flexibility, and that comes from the additional requirements. You know, we're limiting it to continuously sheathed wood structural panels. We're limiting it to 7 16 minimum uh, wood structural panels instead of the, the IRC 3 8 even though 7 16 is commonly used. And we did have those increased fastener requirements in certain stories, not everywhere, but certain stories of your house. It's just gonna, the APA method cast a much wider net you're going to be able to apply it to more houses great thank you thanks again for your presentation and all of the questions that you've answered and to our panelists for helping us answer questions mostly to our audience for participating and asking us good questions we really appreciate you if you had a question we didn't get to we will share those with our field services team and get back to you as soon as we can before we conclude, I do want to touch on a couple of quick things. First, please remember to participate in our survey. As I mentioned earlier, it can be found by following the QR code on your screen or through a link sent to your email soon. We really appreciate your feedback and take it into account for every session, so please take a minute and fill that out. Also, don't forget to download your certificate of completion from the links in the follow-up email that will be sent in about an hour. And finally, make sure that you are signed up to receive our APA update newsletter so that you will be notified of our future webinars and updates to APA publications and standards. To receive it, all you need to do from our homepage is to click on sign in in the upper right-hand corner of the page. In the drop-down menu, simply select register. From there, you will let, need to let us know what you would like to receive from APA, in this case, the APA Update Newsletter. And today's team are just some of the field staff that we have throughout the country. These talented people are available to assist design professionals, builders, and code officials. Their individual contact information can be found on our APA website, www.apawood.org please feel free to reach out and take advantage of this resource. As I mentioned earlier, a recording of today's webinar will be posted at apawood.org soon. And with that, I'd like to thank you for attending. Have a great day.